these people who I'm mean, kind of naturalist at heart, so it um, I tend to think of philosophy and the natural sciences as engaged in sort of the same thing, just trying to figure out how the world works and how everything hangs together. And I don't think there's any sharp distinction between doing theoretical biology and philosophy of biology. So um, a lot of the philosophical work that I'm interested in involves um, thinking about relatively abstract issues in, in evolutionary theory. I think evolutionary theory kind of fades into philosophy. I do tend to think that um, philosophers are at least entitled to weigh in on some of the issues that biologists work on and think about. But the main reason why I think that is that um, some of the biologists that whose work I find most engaging and exciting and interesting to think about are already doing a lot of philosophy. Um, and so I think this is true of Darwin. I think uh, it's true of someone like Stephen Jay Gould, who is philosophically well informed and whose work on evolutionary theory draws a great deal on, uh, you know, on philosophy that he was acquainted with. Um, uh, so I guess uh, one thing one thing I'd want to say is because biologists are doing a lot, quite a bit of philosophy anyway already. I don't see any harm in us philosophers joining on in. <laughs> It's true that there are very few people working right now in philosophy of paleontology in particular. The numbers grow a little bit if you broaden things out to include philosophy of historical science. Um, so you, if you include geology, archaeology, you can, you can bring a few more people into the fold. Um, and sometimes that's how I think about my work, is focusing on historical science more broadly. Um, yeah, so one of, one of my goals, I suppose, over in recent years has just been to help identify the philosophy of paleontology as an interesting subfield of philosophy of biology where there are questions worth working on, where there's interesting work to do, um, uh, with the idea of um, just kind of maybe setting the stage for future work with you know, hopefully new graduate students coming along will find this to be an interesting um, area in which to, to do some research. So a trend is usually defined as a persisting directional change in some measure or some variable of interest and it could be anything. So you could, global warming is a trend, um, Economists study trends all the time. Um, uh, grade inflation on a college or university campus is a trend. Um, these are all examples of trends. Um, and I would argue that evolution is all about trends in biological systems. Um, so microevolution is uh, generally what you have when you're looking at trends within populations. Um, and you know, in population genetics, you might focus on trends in gene frequencies. Uh, you might focus on trends in trait frequencies. Um, or you might focus on other kinds of, of trends that um, occur within biological populations. Macroevolution involves trends that show up at larger scales, um, larger time scales, but also larger scales in a, in a biological sense. So um, a nice example would be uh, evolutionary body size increase. So if you look at the history of mammals from you know, 65 million years ago to the present, you'll see an increase in the average of the mammal body size um, overall. And there's still lots of small mammals uh, running around, but that increase in the mean is a nice example of a large scale trend. Um, and it's the kind of trend that you'd focus on if you're studying macro evolution. I take it that species sorting refers merely to the differential persistence, speciation, and extinction of, of lineages. Um, and you know, that's just a, 
a phenomenon. I mean, that just happens in nature. Um, I don't think anyone, you know, anyone questions that. During mass extinction events, there's sorting that occurs. Some species go extinct and some don't, and that's interesting. And, you know, paleontologists uh, look at these cases to try to figure out why, what's going on, why do, why do some persist when others don't, and um, how do you explain those, those sorts of patterns. Um, uh, so, and I take it that um, whatever it is, species selection would be one kind of species sorting or one, a certain type of, of species sorting process. And the question is, um, from my point of view, what do you have to do? What do you have to add to species sorting processes in order to get something like a, a robust notion of, of species selection? And the simplest, kind of the, the weakest notion of species selection that you can generate, and it's actually one that I find, I actually think it's quite interesting, um, uh, is um, you, you can generate this just by talking about biases in sorting. You can go back to certain evolutionary thinkers in the 19th century people like Edward Drinker Cope, and you can find them speculating a little bit about how certain things like average body size or something like that might influence extinction risk. Cope observes that, um, you know, at the end of the Mesozoic, the lineages that seem to survive in mass extinction tend to be smaller. He's thinking about the mammals uh, that make it through, and then he's, he notices that a lot of the species that go extinct tend to be larger. Here he's thinking about the dinosaurs that, that go extinct at the end. And, um, you know, from then on, from that point on, um, at least since Cope, there have been speculations here and there about different ways in which different features that lineages have might make a difference to their extinction risk. You know, maybe there's something about the lineages that increases extinction risk. Or maybe uh, different species can have different features that make a difference to speciation rates. Uh, uh, you know, one, one feature that's been looked at is, say, geographic range size. Uh, you know, in addition to, to uh, body size. So there, there are a number of different things you could look at. And if you, if you find things like this that make a difference to extinction risk or speciation rate or, or what have you, then all of a sudden, um, you're talking about something that looks a lot like fitness at the level of species. So what you're saying is, well, the, the sorting that happens, the, the differential extinction speciation persistence, it's not just uh, random. It's not like a lottery. Uh, there are things about those species that are making a difference to their um, probability of persisting and going extinct or speciating. You know, as soon as you um, have a situation where features of the species are biasing the process, it looks a lot like um, fitnesses at the population level, and it looks a lot like natural selection. Um, and that's actually something like that, the kind of biased sorting process like that is probably the weakest notion of species selection that's been defended. It just so happens that um, the, the big ideas about macroevolution that um, I've been thinking most about in the last few years, so, um, historical contingency is one, uh, punctuated equilibria, species selection, um, and then moving away from the kinds of things that Stephen Jay Gould really um, is associated with the distinction between passive and driven evolutionary trends, which is a big one uh, in paleontology today. Um, also interested in recent work that um, Robert Brandon and Dan McShay have been doing on the zero force evolutionary law, uh, which I also interpret as a you know, kind of a big claim about how macroevolution works. Um, these sorts of things are all, I mean, I see these as theoretical innovations that have happened since about 1970, 
beginning in the early 70s. And I'm not sure, you know, it's controversial just how much any of these ideas goes against the modern synthesis. This was especially, you know, an issue with some of Stephen Jay Gould's proclamations, you know, that the modern synthesis was over. Um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure these things really go against the synthesis, but they're definitely, you know, <laughs> these ideas are, are coming along after the modern synthesis is really solidified, and they're extending it or adjusting it in various ways um, that, that I find really interesting. So I would, I would definitely be among those people who think the modern synthesis is not the last word by any means on, on how evolution works at, at large scales. The book I really wrote uh, with my students in mind. You know, I teach classes on philosophy of biology and Darwin. And, you know, I wanted to write something that would introduce the students I know to the kind of research that I care most about. Um, so that it had to be somewhat accessible. The other thing about it is the, the book kind of uh, reflects my own learning experience. So well, earlier on when I first got interested in historical science and paleontology in particular from the philosophical point of view, um, I approached these, the disciplines um, with uh, a real concern about the scientific realism debate in the background. And the scientific realism debate is this, um, you know, I'm still very interested in it, but it's, it's kind of a philosophy first thing. I mean, it's the, the questions of the realism debate really echo very traditional questions in metaphysics and epistemology. Um, and what happened is, as I started thinking about paleontology from that direction, or from with the realism debate in mind, you know, I, I learned more and more about the science. And uh, the more I learned about the science, the more I realized that there are just these really, really interesting theoretical issues that paleontologists have been talking about for the last 25 or 30 years, if not longer. So these, these questions about macroevolution really started to draw me in, and I, you know, I got, I, I studied Stephen Jay Gould's work more and more, and came to appreciate him more as a thinker, um, and came to, uh, came to have a better understanding of just how systematic his, his thinking was, and, um, and he started to look more and more like a traditional philosopher <laughs> to me, um, so, uh, over time, um, I, I think I sort of evolved from being a philosopher of science uh, who's mainly interested in how historical sciences like paleontology might be sources of examples for these larger debates that philosophers have been having about you know, scientific realism and various kinds of anti-realism. So it evolved from that kind of person into person who cares a little bit less about the general realism, anti-realism issues, and cares a lot more about the specific issues you know, the scientists are thinking about and working on.